identify what are the expected uh, roles for, for each of uh, them. So if we go to the next slide, I will briefly um, let you know that my name is uh, Bruno Montaire. I'm a policy analyst at the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, as I mentioned. It. And uh, I have today with me my colleague Beatriz Lamonte and Joan Lopes that, that have been working uh, hardly, very hardly in the backstage to put together this uh, role uh, program. In the previous uh, slide, uh, we have an overview of the agenda. Uh, it's just to give you a sense of what we can expect for, for today. As you can see, it's a very busy schedule. So we will beg for your understanding in uh, following up uh, the times that we have decided. And more importantly, and this for all of you, to take this as an opportunity that is not a closure, but it is a moment of openness where we hope not just to, but we also hope that you can have a, 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 an important dialogue with, with all of you that are joining uh, today this, this session. Today, we prepared, and as you will see in the next uh, slides, we, I prepared to you a, a story. I, I want to share with you a story. It's, um, it's a short story that, as you will see, have real people inside. And my presentation will be mostly to highlight the importance of having these real people from real government teams teaming up and collaborating across borders to put together this uh, program. It is also a moment where we hope to recognize these efforts, these extra efforts uh, these colleagues are making to share their challenges or to come up with their experience to collaborate in finding positive uh, solutions. And let me tell you uh, from the start, this journey was not and is not going to be flashy or always flashy. It is not going to be always flawless. And that's why we have an experimental approach like the Innovation Incubator. It's a safe space for us to exchange and to learn in a protected moment where we can feel comfortable in coming forward with our doubts, with coming forward with our ideas without uh, feeling uh, the need uh, to compromise what we are doing um, by creating that, uh, that I will say, special area to, 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 to work together. At the same time, the incubation process is in itself an experimental initiative. We were not totally convinced that this is going to work. And it was, in fact, the reaction we found among the global community that proved that we had been eating something uh, that could be positive, beneficiary for, for the countries that are participating. So what we are doing in this first edition of the Innovation Incubator is, of course, bringing value to these projects, setting up a safe space, as I mentioned, for teams to work across border. But it's also an opportunity for us to learn together, to improve what we are doing by accumulating uh, learnings that we hope to generate together in the coming uh, months. As usually, as usually happens, we started with the global exploration of existing incubators and accelerators for public sector. We identified that the public sector has its own specificities. There is, of course, incubators and acceleration in the public sector that have provided, I will say, a clear vision about what are the roles of governments that are not exactly the same as the roles uh, played by other kinds of actors, for instance, in the private sector. And we have taken from this exploration of 88 case studies two important takeaways. The first one is that international borders, no matter what we say about globalization, still hamper the collaboration between governments. Other areas have been more efficient in collaborating across borders. Governments still have, I will say, a role to take to improve this kind of collaboration. On the other side, there was the well-identified need to strengthen this collaboration across borders by creating a shared platform, not just because some of the challenges are transversal, so they cross uh, borders, but also because even when this didn't happen, they are very similar challenges that may call for collaboration uh, in terms of the 
tools, in terms of the learnings, in terms of the experiences accumulated by different governments. In the next slide, you will see that based on these uh, learnings, we identify, of course, opportunity to work around shared challenges, but also to bring together shareable knowledge, knowledge that we can share and that we can make circulate across the borders. And for that in particular, we wonder if we could transform these blind spots where the borders are impairments for government collaboration into sweet spots. That means focusing specifically on that obstacle, making that obstacle the center of the innovation incubator. And that's why we developed, as you will see in the next slide, this uh, model of a government-to-government -government innovation incubator that promotes this cross-border co collaboration uh, uh, among governments that share similar innovation challenges. In the next slide, we see that th this value proposition translated in a program that has, of course, this peer learning process, but also that brings on board experts that will contribute with insights, with their learnings to, I will say, nurture this uh, process. We also hope this to be an occasion to provide recognition and visibility, very well deserved recognition and visibility to many government teams, like the ones you are going to see, that have been making huge efforts to produce successful, impactful, value-creating initiatives. And at the same, and, and finally, this program wants to be a long-term uh, support process. We don't believe in the magical properties of events per se. We believe it is important to weave together close relationships, create trust between teams. And the whole process of incubator is precisely designed to do that. The next slide shows that we have been taking this whole process that already started in December 2023. So we kept working uh, in a way to, in, in order to use iteration loops as a way to, to, to generate knowledge that we, we are using to improve the process while we are doing it. So since it is the first time we are running the process, we have been learning a lot. We have been adjusting the program as we walk, so to speak. In the next slide, you see that we identify the call in the call for challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 72 submissions uh, from 25 different countries, very different countries. All continents are represented there, uh, with exception of Antarctica, of course. We have identified some points of leverage that uh, the, the call for challenges um, promoted. We have also identified that some of these challenges are exactly positioned in the cutting edge of what innovation teams are struggling or pushing uh, uh, to accomplish in their governments. Then in the next slide, so we can go quickly. We have identified this for challenges, I won't go into detail because you will have the opportunity, the privilege of knowing uh, each of them uh, personally. But we have these uh, cases from France, Brazil, Italy, and Spain, more to come in the coming uh, moments. And after doing this work of identifying uh, challenges, we have gone through a process, as the next slide shows, of doing a call for solutions. That means if these countries have challenges and if these challenges resonate as we, we quickly saw with other countries, they may also call for government teams that have been working on similar um, issues to come forward with the learning they have accumulated, to come forward with the ideas they have generated while solving uh, similar uh, challenges. We received in this case 26 submissions from 18 countries. Initially, we planned to uh, select just four um, solution providers, as we have been calling them. But as a matter of fact, the high quality of the submissions uh, call for call for us to 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 bring on board uh, uh, instead of just four eight uh, solution providers. We really believe these eight teams um, not just as a huge um, amount of experience and learnings but they also show the ability, the willingness to partner uh, with, with, with other colleagues into, into a, 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 a way that is very directed to, to practical uh, consequences. And then just to try to finalize, 
we have done our matchmaking exercise uh, for each of the four challenges. As you can see, we have a very diverse uh, composition of each of the teams. More to come in the coming uh, slides. And now that we are approaching the end, I just want to highlight that the incubation process is just now starting. The teams that are participating in, the, in, in this process, um, you are going to know them in a, in, a, in a minute. But I want to profit from this occasion to let you know that you can take a look at the web page we created for the incubator. Feel free to reach out to our dedicated email. Um, you can take uh, you can take a look at your at the chat where we are going to share uh, both the website and, uh, and the email. We hope this uh, incubation process as a pioneer initiative uh, on this realm to be just the first of its kind. So we hope also that the community of practice of the community of, 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 of people that we have been gathering in this uh, session to help us to improve future initiatives, uh, to let us to uh, make that the insights, the learnings that are being generated in this program can be disseminated, can be shared across the world. So we can see that the benefits of this program can generate value in many of uh, uh, the countries that are here uh, represented today. So please always feel part of this process. Please feel always part of this community. From the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, we exist precisely to support governments in their journey to transformation, including by connecting uh, them across borders and supporting experimental process like the one we are uh, presenting today. And I will stop here. Thank you again for your for your patience and for your attention hearing, hearing me in this introduction. Thank you so much, Bruno. Uh, now we're going to move on to the challenges and to meet the teams that build this incubator. Um, the first one is the challenge from Brazil. How can we promote broader and more equi equi equitable digital participation? And to talk to us to talk to us about this challenge, we have Carla Bezerra from Brazil Participativo. Uh, good good morning from Brazil, everyone. I know you're all in different time uh, zones, so. Um, it's a pleasure to be here participating at the OECD uh, challenge, gov to gov challenge. And so first we would like to present, we are a big team uh, located in the General Secretariat of the Presidency of the Republic. Uh, it, the General Secretariat is responsible for social participation in general. And there we have a directorate of digital participation. This is a, a picture of our team uh, we are all uh, driven by the, the values, first of democracy and participation for everyone, to include everyone, uh, and all, all Brazilians, to be able to, to participate. And that's, what, that's the main idea that drives our, uh, our goal in this challenge as well. Please, next slide. So what are what is our challenge? Um, we want to improve access and inclusiveness of underrepresented and marginalized groups in Brazil Participativo. Uh, so the idea is to we with Brazil Participativo we reached a large audiences in our first um, participatory process. We reached about one point four million Brazilians, but we know we didn't reach everyone. We know there are specific groups that are not able to use digital tools for different reasons, either for uh, infrastructural access or for digital literacy issues. So we, that's what we want to target in this uh, in this challenge. So we uh, we are there are different groups that are uh, outside the digital world, but specifically in this for this challenge, we're, we're targeting low income groups and black people, which are the main population uh, in, in Brazilian uh, big cities uh, peripheries. So that in, we don't think we can, uh, we can target, for example, other uh, indigenous people or other people who lack infrastructure. 
but maybe we can uh, overcome by improving the uh, the access of the tool. So that's what we're targeting in this challenge. Next slide, please. So why it is important? I would say that uh, it's, for us, it's almost uh, uh, obvious that we need to include everyone, but well, ensuring digital inclusive, inclusiveness is key to guaranteeing uh, equitable participation and um, including uh, underrepresented communities is a way to reinforce democracy itself. And that's what we believe. When we, we are, by using a digital tool for us, uh, which is merged with in-person processes, that's something that very important in our, in Brazil participative experience, you, we always uh, connect the digital and the in-person processes. The idea is to get the best of each uh, tool uh, that we have. So the idea is that by amplifying um, participation, by increasing participation, we can reinforce democracy itself. So that's the key idea and that's the key thing that we are addressing this challenge. Thank you, Carla, for the short presentation for such a big challenge. Uh, now we have the solution providers, and we're going to start by the New York City Civic Engagement Commission, but with Oscar Romero. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody. So my name is Oscar Romero. I am the Chief Information Officer of the Civic Engagement Commission. The commission was founded in 2018 by ballot measure uh, to create more participatory democratic processes across the city of New York. The, as you can imagine, New York City is, is a very complex city. We have eight and a half million people, 40% of which are foreign born. We have more than 800 languages spoken in the city. And so one of the main ways in which we implement a participatory democracy is through a process known as the people's money, which is a participatory budgeting. Two years ago, we were challenged with the task of launching the first citywide participatory budgeting. And the, and the key issue was how do we do civic engagement in communities as diverse, particularly in those neighborhoods that face different forms of systemic inequality, whether it is limited access to infrastructure, different in, uh, low indices in terms of different poverty indicators. And as you might imagine, the legacy of segregation in, 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 in the infrastructure of New York City also limits and creates boundaries for, for low income and diverse communities that are along that go along the lines of race, ethnicity, and, and, in, and immigration status. So what we did is we partnered with a network of more than 100 community-based organizations. In a span of three months, we were able to create uh, more than 500 workshops where we talk to people, uh, it, whether it was focused on particular ethnic groups in particular languages that were facing different specific forms of inequality, whether it was being justice impacted by the criminal justice system in the US or, or limited access due to different forms of disabilities that people experience. So in this collective effort, we were able to collect, uh, to enrich about 12,000 people, collect 4,000 ideas, and then discuss these ideas in resident assemblies, randomly selected to represent the diversity of each one of the boroughs that make New York City. Uh, with that, then we created ballots and then made the choice for New Yorkers to actually vote on what projects ought to be implemented. So what we're here to share is really how we go about creating train the trainer methodologies for large community-based organization partnerships. How do we collect and analyze this, this data? How do we integrate offline and online engagements? And most importantly, what do we do with all these inputs? Some projects can be funded, but many more things can become policy recommendations and can and can be part of like the public discourse way beyond our agency. So that's what we're here to do. Now I'll pass it back to Joao because we only have three minutes to get this show going. Thank you so much, Oscar. Um, and now the next solution provider for Brazil's challenge is the Greater London Authority. Um, I believe we have Selena here. 
Hello, hi, I'm Selena Holiday. I'm Head of Digital Engagement at the Greater London Authority and I'm also the service owner for Talk London, which is City Hall's online community. Um, on behalf of the Talk London team, we're really, really excited to be partnering with Brazil alongside, alongside the New York City Civic Engagement Commission on their challenge. Um, so thanks very much for having us along. Uh, as a little bit of context, the Talk London reason for being is to bring the voices of Londoners into City Hall policy and programme making. Uh, we do this in order to help City Hall make better policies and programmes. And we can only do this if we're reaching and engaging a really diverse audience of Londoners. And London is a really diverse city. Um, so promoting broader and more equitable digital participation is a challenge that we think about every day and something that we try and improve through every aspect of the Talk London service. And that includes everything from the user-centric processes we use to redesign the platform to who we run user testing with and how we incorporate user insights into our program of continuous improvements to the end-to-end -end user journeys which start outside of the platform and to how we promote and use segmentation in our campaigns and most importantly how we communicate impact to our members. Uh, the Talk London team also has a remit to improve how the Greater London Authority runs digital engagement with Londoners um, and we also know that the easier we make it for City Hall teams to engage through Talk London and the more that we collaborate with them, the better and more relevant the opportunities for engagement we'll be able to offer to Londoners and the more relevant um, content to engage, more relevant content to engage on also builds credibility and trust and also really helps us diversify our audience. So we have, um, we kind of take quite a holistic view to improving, improving our service. Um, luckily, we've also got great buy-in from our leadership from improving digital engagement. Um, and this is within the context that Talk London is part of the London ecosystem where improving citizen engagement is actively explored. Um, and I, I note that um, the London Office of Technology and Innovation is also a solution provider. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for having us along. Um, we're really, really looking forward to learning from Brazil and New York City, as well as sharing our learnings. And we're really, we're just very excited for this chance to make a difference. Thank you so much, Selena. Um, so those are the teams uh, working on this first challenge. Um, then we have this, our second challenge uh, from France. How can we engage the general public, particularly actors involved in public policies, in common data spaces? And for that, uh, we have Paul Grignon from the Ecolab, which will talk to us about this challenge. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, so yes, we are working at the Ecolab, which is the innovation lab of the French Ministry of Ecological Transition, uh, which is responsible for harnessing data and artificial intelligence uh, in order to support the ecological and energy transitions to inform the government and the ministry's actions regarding the ecological transition. And uh, so we have a different uh, data-driven projects uh, within a collab and so uh, is it possible to switch to the next slide please uh, so, and so the challenge thank you is based on uh, one of these projects which is the green data for health which is a common data space in the health environment domain and so the green data for health initiative is a common data space uh, which aims at fostering the use of data uh, in research and in public action uh, regarding uh, environmental and health issues. And so uh, regarding uh, this uh, uh, platform, this online platform, which is the common data space, the challenge is to foster uh, contributions related to uh, this uh, digital service. So how can we engage the general public and in particular uh, public actors uh, involved uh, in public policies that are not very used to uh, uh, work with data uh, in the use of common data spaces in order to uh, promote uh, evidence-based policies. And so how oh, may the design of uh, data spaces boost uh, contributions of actors and their participation in uh, common data spaces. So the challenge has different uh, uh, sub-objectives, uh, which are uh, engaging actors involved uh, in public policies in the use of common data spaces, 
uh, boosting contributions and participation in uh, common data spaces, uh, relying on uh, behavioral insights uh, in, uh, in order to enhance contribution and participation to such digital services. And the overall goal uh, is to increase the awareness of uh, the data's added value uh, in order to uh, foster the adoption of a data-driven and evidence-based uh, mindset uh, among public actors and among citizens. And so in last, the last slide, uh, why uh, it is, is it important to solve this challenge? Uh, so it's important to increase uh, the awareness about the added value of data and the benefits of sharing new data in order also to promote uh, open data and then the evidence-based uh, policies that can uh, be derived from that. Uh, to increase the effective sharing of data sources and of the new knowledge which is derived from data. Uh, because the uh, data can be a real source of knowledge, it can inform public policies, uh, to allow the emergence of new uses of data and to increase the value derived from it uh, thanks to the common data space. And so the overall aspect is to, uh, uh, the overall objective, sorry, is to uh, uh, feed quantitatively and qualitatively on the long run uh, this collaborative platform, uh, which has to be collaborative, multi-actor, and uh, durable in terms of use in, on, in order to make it a long-run initiative. And so uh, the goal is to increase the interactions also among the different uh, contributors uh, on the one uh, and data producers and on the other one, uh, data users. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, and now to pair up with the French team, we have... First of all, uh, Lottie, and I believe to talk to us about uh, Lottie's participation, we have Genta. Yes, hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone from uh, London. I'm Genta Hadri. I'm the Digital Innovation Delivery Lead at uh, Lottie, so the London Office of Technology and Innovation. Uh, and Lottie is London Local Government's Innovation Team. We work with the Greater London Authority and 28 of the 33 administrative areas in London to collaborate on data, technology, and innovation. In practice, this means working together as local government with other public and private sector organizations, as well as academia to solve some of our city's biggest challenges, like we've heard uh, just now from the French team, be it you know, environment, climate change, be it social care, housing, and digital inclusion. So. Our overall aim as a, as a team is to support London local government colleagues to improve outcomes for Londoners. Um, why we are here and why we're involved in this um, initiative. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much to OECD for the opportunity to be involved in this great initiative. And we are very much looking forward to sharing what we've learned, but also to learn from others as part of this process. So back to what we bring. So we're a team of 10, uh, and as a team of 10, we have a wide range of specialisms and experiences, you know, from running data projects to uh, looking at the kind of data ethics and data uh, sharing aspects of projects, use sort of uh, use of and adoption of tech, as well as applying the latest innovation methods like service design or design thinking, behavioral science, et cetera to support delivery of outcomes for Londoners. And I think more specifically, um, why we're participating in this really, really great initiative is because of our recent work in using both qualitative and quantitative data approaches to design public services. Uh, more specifically, uh, we designed the London Digital Inclusion um, Initiative, which is which we call Get Online London. And Get Online London is London's first, and I think the UK's first digital inclusion service that provides um, free of charge uh, devices, digital devices like laptops, phones, and tablets, as well as connectivity and skills, digital skills to Londoners who need those in order to get online. But I think what's more relevant to the conversation we're having here today is our work that led to the creation of this initiative, which is our qualitative work. So we conducted 
um, user uh, analysis, if you like, service user analysis and um, research with um, real Londoners. And this helped us to create or to um, conclude with a segmentation of analysis, a segmentation analysis, which told us more about the actual, the real needs of real people on the ground when it comes to digital inclusion. Um, the, we paired this with some quantitative analysis that looked at bringing together proxy data um, to help us understand the geographical spreads and hotspots of digital exclusion in our city. And again, uh, it was the culmination of this work together with other research we undertook with um, our voluntary and community sector uh, that led to the creation of the um, our Pan City Digital Inclusion um, Services. So I suppose in summary, the what resonated with the French team's challenge was that principle of involving you know less familiar actors like our citizens and our voluntary and community sector in designing and developing uh, interventions. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Genta. We're um, looking to now. Learning more. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, moving on to the second solution provider, we have Data Room from Finland, and we have Nilo to talk us talk to us a bit more about their team. Their... Yes. Hello, everyone. I hope you hear me well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, I'm project manager at the uh, Data Room. Uh, we are under the uh, BATT Institute for Economic Research which is an institute under the uh, Ministry of Finance in Finland. So we're partly state funded. At the moment, we're a team of uh, 12 people. Uh, and our, our main task uh, is to support ministries with uh, up to date and relatively fast paced data analysis using research methods from uh, economics and statistics. Uh, we use individual and the unit level register data sets on the full Finnish population. Um, like the French team, so we also aim to promote data driven decision making among policymakers. Uh, and what we bring to the table here is experience in creating collaboration between data providers, academics, and policymakers. So we work closely with Statistics Finland. Uh, through whom we also aim to bring novel register data sets uh, for the wider research community to use. And another close collaborator is the uh, Helsinki-based Graduate School of Economics, where professors participate in our projects uh, through designing and advising uh, them. And uh, graduate students participate by conducting uh, government commissioned analysis as part of their own uh, thesis projects. Uh, also, we have experiences where ministry officials themselves have joined uh, the analysis team and gained access to our databases on our Statistics Finland's secure servers. So uh, as such, we hope and uh, we believe that we can support the French team, uh, particularly uh, in engaging policymakers in the utilization of data and also uh, in coming up with ways to make data sets available to a broad community of, of researchers. So super happy to be, be a part of this and looking forward to learning more. Thank you so much, Nilo. Um, so this wraps up our second challenge. And in our third challenge uh, from Italy, uh, we'll be discussing how can we establish a collaborative cross-departmental and inclusive cultural culture for AI project management. And to talk to us about this challenge, we have Emanuele from National Institute of Social Security in Italy. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. It's a real pleasure for us. My name is Emanuele Colini. I'm an executive manager in the IT department of uh, IMPS. That is uh, one of the major public administration in Italy. So who we are 
Uh, our team can be defined as a cross-functional unit because it's composed by members of the IT department, me and Antonino Cipriani. But also we have the participation of Valeria Bonavolontà that in IMPS deals with international relations. So our team for sure collaborates with other departments in our big, I mean, let's say huge organization in order to improve work processes and conduct cross-departmental projects in IT environment. But we are also actively involved in uh, international collaborations with public entities from other countries to promote the exchange of the best practices in the public sector. So next, please. What is the challenge? The challenge we face uh, is to establish a collaborative, cross-departmental and inclusive culture for AI project management. So actually, in IMPS, we are experimenting AI technology in our projects since 2021. And as we know, AI projects require not only technological expertise, but also the coordination of different skills. So we would like to create uh, an AI competence center in a dedicated unit uh, within the organization with the goal to foster internal AI development share best practices within the organization and disseminate them across public administrations. Next, please. Which are the benefits we expect? So um, we have a dream, as someone said in the past, so that the AI Competence Center will act as a catalyzer among the different departments in our organization. With it will allow a better coordination, but also it will increase our operational efficiency. So we will need to standardize project, project management processes and to enhance communication and collaboration between our colleagues. But the final target uh, as a public firm is to provide an even better experience and service to our end users, our citizens. So the AI Competence Center should allow to create a new culture in the organization in order to understand how AI could definitely help us to increase our services. And at the same time, be aligned to guarantee compliance to the European AI Act. So thank you very much for your attention and we look forward to your to your support and the collaboration in this exciting journey. Thank you, Emanuele. Um, so now that we know the Italy's challenge, uh, we'll get to know the teams that are matching up with the Italian team. And the first one is the Norwegian Digital Agency. And we have here Heather that will talk to us a bit more about their team in their collaboration. Uh, hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here today. I'm here. So I'm Heather Broomfield and my colleague here, Oystein. Osmus um, has, has joined me here today as well. So we come from the Norwegian Develop Digitalization Agency, or better known as DIGDIR. And our role is faster and more to encourage faster and more coordinated digitalization of the public sector in Norway. More specifically, um, Oystein and I work in the National Resource Centre for sharing and use of data within the agency. This is a team of about 10 people um, and we work very much to support the public sector in both the sharing and use of data. So obviously AI is a major part of what we do. Um, Norway has a huge opportunity when it comes to artificial intelligence due largely to the amount of data that has been collected to manage the welfare state for decades. And also because we're a highly digitalized country, there's a real opportunity for us. Of course, this also brings with it a huge responsibility um, in terms of making sure this is all done in a responsible way. Um, we're very, very conscious here in Norway that AI and data are two sides of the same coin and must be approached in a professional manner and in, in a multidisciplinary way. So we're very conscious of bringing in uh, very many different disciplines into this. When it comes specifically to artificial intelligence in the public sector, we've been working on this for some time now. Um, we've built guidance material for the public service. We have an overview of AI projects in the public sector. There's a national AI in the public sector network. And this is very, very important for knowledge sharing um, and sharing of best practice. It has grown from, I think we started with maybe about 15, 15 participants at each meeting and we have now about 150 to 200 at each meeting. So it's a very important network for us. 
And we also work very closely with the rest of the public sector in the use of artificial intelligence. Most of the through direct use of AI actually happens out in the service providers themselves, such as the health and transport sectors, the welfare authority, and, and the tax authority. These are all very avid users of artificial intelligence. And we hope to bring them in to, to our, our work along the way, either to share their experiences and, and maybe to discuss and, and, and um, along the way. So I suppose it just is left to say thank you very much for today. We're very excited to be part of this work. We're very much looking forward to working on this challenge and learning it during this challenge as well, because as anyone knows, working with AI in the public sector, none of us are experts here yet, and we're all learning together. Um, and we were look, very much looking forward to sharing what we do have so far um, and uh, together with Italy and of course, working with the Netherlands along the way as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Heather, for the kind words. And alongside uh, Dick Deer, we have uh, what for a non-Dutch speaker is incredibly scary to pronounce, but Rijk ICT Gilde. Uh, and we have Robert Boss to talk to us a little bit more about their contribution. Yeah, so I will pronounce it correctly. My name is Robert Boss. I'm from the Rijks ICT Gilde. Typical Dutch name. I'm working at the Dutch government. Uh, with the Rijks ICT Gilde, I'm the head of product, uh, and I'm also involved in a project that is part of the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Kingdom Relations in the Netherlands. They now uh, have a team, an AI validation team, and that is a team that is part of the, in the Department of Policymakers. But as an experiment, uh, we are bringing in engineers. So we are a team with engineers, really close to policymakers, so that we can... Uh, also exchange our knowledge with them with everything that is going on in the field of AI. For that team, I'm the product manager. Uh, besides bringing in our knowledge into the, the, this department, we are also collaborating with other AI and governance teams from other ministries and government-related organizations. One of the projects that we are working on is an algorithm management toolkit uh, where we focus on making regulations and obligations executable so that you can integrate into the work process of data science teams already so that they can follow up on all these uh, obligations they will bump into when they are developing algorithm systems. Um, so that will become a central platform. Uh, we're also calling it algorithm bookkeeping with the idea that you can make it more transparent, more explainable, that it will be easier to do audits, that you can publish in the registers because in the Netherlands, we already have an algorithm register but in the follow up in the AI Act in the, uh, in the UAE, you will also have an European uh, algorithm register. So we are preparing for these uh, developments as well. So that's also what we're going to bring in into this, uh, into this challenge because uh, Maybe really typical for the Dutch and market, but we have uh, yeah learned a lot in the last uh, couple of months, and we would like to share our experience and ideas with the Italy team. And we are also curious uh, to hear more about their ideas because I think if we can uh, collaborate on these fields, we can also figure out a uh, solution that can work for Europe and maybe even uh, for other countries as well. The other nice last closure thing from from my side is that we are working fully open source. We are doing everything on GitHub. So everyone can follow us because we are working from the principle that public money is public code. So uh, we are making as much as possible uh, available for everyone. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, so that is our third challenge. And last but not least, we're entering our fourth challenge uh, from Junta de Andalucía in Spain. In how how can we improve accessibility to public services for people in vul vulnerable situations and at risk of exclusion? And for that, we're going to have Esperanza uh, explaining their challenge. Uh, good afternoon for everyone. We are very, de very delightful to be here with you, and we hope to learn a lot of you. Um, to undertake this challenge, uh, the Junta de Andalucía has a versatile and multidisciplinary team of ex experts in law, information technology, statistics, citizen services, and innovation. This project is transversal for the entire organi organization, 
although it's led by the public function department, depending on Ministry of Justice, local administration and public function. Additionally, it's supported by the Ministry of Presidency, responsible for territorial administration, the Digital Agency of Andalusia and the Public Administration Institute, responsible for innovation, an area in which they have extensive experience. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Junta de Andalucía has been immersed in a digital transformation strategy for years, which has enabled us to establish a structure for in-person services called registration offices, the O12 telephone service, and an artificial intelligence chatbots. With a new innovative public administration uh, strategy that we are implementing, we aim to take a step further and focus on citizens and the important moments in life. Uh, services will be digital by default, but without leaving, leaving anyone behind. Uh, we can forget the percentage of Andalusians at risk of social exclusion, people with disabilities, uh, and, the, and the increase of elder, elderly people living alone, particularly women, because of the longer life expectancy. And of course, people living in remote rural areas. One of the lines being defined is the removal of access barriers to services in general, with a particular emphasis on electronic services. This challenge aims to focus on avoiding exclusion for two main groups, like the aforementioned people in vulnerable situations due to poverty, disability, age, and people in rural areas far from in-person services centers. Uh, ne next slide, please. Uh, we have an extensive network of in-person services, but it doesn't cover 100% of the territory. With a new strategy, we aim to build a true network of assistance and support that provides full coverage using other peripheral centers, such as agricultural, district offices, employment offices, medical centers, puntos vuela, etc. The objective of our strategy is broad. In regard to this challenge, it's to build a true network of assistance and support for citizens in fair conditions through the existing peripheral administration, making the project feasible and sustainable over time. What we want to achieve with this project a set of initiatives, successful or not, carried out by other countries that can help us decide whether to follow routes already taken by others, new ideas and new ways to remove barriers that we can incorporate into our strategy, and feedback on the measures plan based on the experience of other countries to increase their, their viability and chances of success. Um, that's all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Esperanza. Uh, and to partner with Spain in this challenge, we have um, Laboratorio de Gobierno, all the way from Chile. Uh, and we have Laura Gonzalez to talk to us a little bit about their participation. Hello, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. <laughs> My name is Laura Gonzalez Casanova. I am the acting head of the IIL Consulting Service of the Government Lab. First, let me introduce the Government Lab. We are a state agency under the Ministry of Finance. Since 2015, we have been driving the transformation of the Chilean government through a public innovation model. Our mission is to co-create solutions to priority public issues while establishing and measuring the innovation capacities within public institutions. <coughs> Based on our experience, we have identified various elements that can help public institutions achieve sustainable inno innovations. We have classified into 12 types of innovation grouped into four key areas strategy, service, operation, and organization, which we will use to propose solutions that can be sustainable in the long term. On the other hand, our approach is guided by five principles of public innovation. First, people at the center. We place the focus on users, 
public uh, civil servants and the public to the improve their quality of life. Second, multidimensional approach or multidisciplinary teams take tackles problems from different perspectives, incorporation feedback from various, various stakeholders. Third, co-creation, collaboration with public institutions and citizens is fundamental to creating public value. Fourth, uh, evidence-based. Our solutions are tested and true prototypes and pilots before full-scale implementation, ensuring their effectiveness. Fifth, <laughs> implementation-oriented. <laughs> Our project aims to become public policies that create in positive impacts for institutions, civil servants, and the broader public. An excellent example of our pro uh, of our, our work is the Electronic Family Pocket project, developed to assist families in managing the rising cost of food. This initiative provides a monthly financial benefit through a state bank account, especially for food purchases. <coughs> the system allows families to manage their household budgets more flexibly thanks to a user-friendly digital platform that simplifies the process and improves accessibility. Thank you very much for your attention. We are happy to participate in this challenge alongside the government of Andalusia and the team from Canada. <coughs> Thank you so much, Laura. And our last team on this challenge is the Employment and Social Development in Canada, so all the way from Canada. And I think we have Kara to tell us more a bit uh, about their participation in their team. Thanks so much. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where in the world you're joining this call. Uh, my name is Kara Rideout, and I'm the Manager of Service Research at Employment and Social Development Canada. I'm here today with many of my colleagues from Employment and Social Development Canada, Service Canada, and the Canada Revenue Agency. Collectively, our organizations are responsible for delivering most federal government services to Canadian citizens and people living in Canada. Uh, so we administer roughly 37% of federal government spending on programs. So our organizations are committed to understanding and reducing barriers faced by marginalized and underserved Canadians and people who live in Canada. These most vulnerable clients include children, low-income seniors, families, individuals living in rural and remote communities, and Indigenous communities who have traditionally faced significant challenges in accessing government services here in Canada. Uh, we are excited to have the opportunity to collaborate with Chain, Spain and Chile on Spain's Innovation Challenge. Uh, our agencies have worked very closely and very hard over the past five to seven years uh, to help move us towards a more inclusive and accessible digital service model. We're hopeful that in sharing our experiences with Spain and Chile that we can provide some important and insightful considerations and lessons learned. We're also looking forward to learning from Chile and Spain. Um, you know, their different viewpoints and experiences can be really helpful on our own transformation journey that we continue to be on. Uh, so we see this innovation incubator as a mutually beneficial collaboration opportunity. So what are some specifics? So one of the things we focused on in Canada is improving the use of our knowledge and data assets to expand our understanding of what client means, where they are, and who amongst them are most at risk of exclusion in a digital world. Uh, for example, we're looking forward to sharing some of our approaches to measuring risk of digital exclusion and how that knowledge uh, has been leveraged or how it could be leveraged in future. Uh, similarly, we've undertaken a lot of transformation initiatives to help sort of better understand clients and meet them where they are. So in terms of their service needs and ease of access in digital capacity. So these underpinning initiatives include reaching all Canadians, which was included sort of targeted outreach activities and um, specific service um, approaches. Um, the marginalized and underserved populations, which was a, a significant piece of research we did to really understand who we were missing in our service world and start to identify solutions that we could implement to better serve those groups. Um, on the grants and contributions side, we had a reducing program barrier barriers to program access initiatives. So that's important in the Canadian context because we have a lot of uh, non-governmental organizations that um, 
we partner with and help support service delivery. So those that too is also um, a barrier to access and really understanding, uh, you know, how we could better support those entities. And then we have a specific activity called recently launched in the last couple of years called the Supporting Black Canadian Communities Initiative, again, which we're happy to share more details about. Finally, transformation is never easy. We have learned that. It requires sustained, consistent intervention, and there will be bumps, bumps along the road. Uh, certainly, the Canadian experience in our has accelerated since it started in 2018, decelerated during the pandemic, and now we're you know, in that acceleration phase again and change. Um, in our world, client centricity in all we do, everything from program design to staff upscaling for a mod modern digital service model is essentially, essential, excuse me, to enabling change and addressing the needs of our clients of today and those of the future. We are really excited to embark on this collaboration journey and look forward to our first session on October 9th. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, and now that we looked at the challenges, we're going to be looking at the advisory board that's going to be supporting uh, this program. And for that, we have Bea Beatrice, who is going to talk to, to us a little bit more about their contribution. Thank you, Joao, and good afternoon, morning, everyone. So along this process of the last five months, the OECD, OPSI Secretariat, has counted with the support of an advisory board composed of international experts from the innovation ecosystem and coming from different domains. The role of this advisory board is to enlarge our perspectives, challenge us with thought-provoking questions, and share experiences and references with the teams. We want to welcome the advisory board to this public launch and thank them for their support so far. Also, we ask three members of the advisory board to tell us about the value of the incubator for them and what were the points of view on the role of this initiative for cross-border government collaboration. So today we have Tania Filler, Lara Salinas and Andrea Ray that will share with us their views on the gov to gov innovation incubator. We will start with Tania. Dr. Tanya Filler is founder and CEO of StateUp, a leading provider of public purpose technology intelligence. Thank you for joining us today, Tanya, and welcome. Tell us, what's the value you see of this initiative? Thank you so much, and it's a, a real pleasure to join everyone today and also to be part of this process overall, and how inspiring to hear all those presentations that we've just listened to. Um, I think I'll share just three observations on what I think um, the value of this program is and, and three of the aspects that kind of really speak to, to what I think is, is valuable for, for governments and for people everywhere. Um, the first is I love the approach of really starting from identifying and trying to tackle barriers to innovation and collaboration in the public sector. Be saying, what are those barriers on the level of organization, on the level of infrastructure, um, on the level of institutions, and designing then the program to tackle each of those? I think that's a, a great thing point. And I can see that um, through the aspects of knowledge sharing and the G2G model, it really is very targeted. And I think in both direct and indirect ways can help to tackle those barriers. The second is that I love the idea that this can be a way to scale the impact of innovations. So this program is not exactly about kind of replication, but it's about lesson learning and, and, and sharing ideas. And that's then a way to really scale the impact, including of course, across borders of individual products, but more to the point, the thinking behind them, the ideas behind them, really scale, scaling the impact on that level. And finally, I love the idea that I just referred to scaling. I often think scaling is a, a bit of a misnomer. What we're often talking about when we talk about scaling is diversification. And I think that's exactly what we're going to see here, that it's not taking individual products and repeating them in a cookie cutter way. It's really diversifying what the innovations themselves look like that come out of these hopefully very productive conversations, and also diversifying in relation to the different contexts um, in which the new innovations are going to be generated. So really starting from, con from context, understanding that um, 
each of the places involved have different populations, mm. different demographics, different landscapes, and um, drawing on what other cities and national governments are doing and places are doing and bringing in bringing it into the toolkit but really starting i think those those three elements tackling barriers scaling the impact of innovation and the ideas behind them and then diversifying innovation and starting from context i think each is incredibly valuable and i'm sure will produce very very good outcomes from the program overall thank you Thank you so much, Tania. We continue with Dr. Lara Salinas. Lara is a design researcher and educator, co-director of the Service Futures Lab at London College of Communication, University of Arts, London. Lara, thanks for coming and welcome. Tell us, how do you see this initiative? Thank you, Beatriz, and thank you everyone for, for sharing the challenges, the solutions, and, and your reflections. So I think Bruno has already given a very good overview, and so has Tania. Uh, but I think I wanted to talk or reflect a bit about uh, how the program is creating a safe, safer space for innovation. Maybe what Tania was referring to as that space for learning and for sharing ideas. And I wanted to be a bit provocative and, and, and say that failing and failure is really a, an essential part of any journey. Uh, and of course, an, of any innovation journey, that without failure, there is no learning. And if there is no learning, then there is no, no, no innovation. Uh, however, I think we are very little failure tolerant uh, in, in, in innovation and in particular in public sector. So as natural as failing might be, uh, when we are on the job, obviously, and we have to deploy a new solution or come up with a new solution to an old or a new problem, we want to get it right. And also we must get it right. And failing is really not an option. Uh, but I would like to invite you to let the job on the side and then think of any other moments where you have been uncertain about a problem and about the possible solution. And I think if you are not at work, the first thing that we all think of is, well, I need to learn from someone else, right? I need a critical friend. So when that I can ask for advice in a very friendly manner that I can learn from uh, someone I respect and someone that uh, I consider to be an expert in the matter. And that's a privileged position to be in, really. And I think that's what's very exciting about uh, gov to gov uh, that is enabling this cross-border government collaboration and is matching those who own a problem with those who have that first-hand experience uh, of successfully tackling uh, these very similar problems and therefore creating that very safe space for learning and for innovation. Uh, so that's what's uh, kind of the highlight of the program for me. Uh, and also, uh, I have to say, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to collaborate with some leading international organizations that I have admired uh, for many years. And of course, to work on social inclusion, which I'm very passionate about, and as an Andalusian myself, uh, to be able to work with the Andalusian government as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lara. We are so happy to have you on board as well. So now it's the turn of Andrea Erey. Andrea works as policy officer for public sector innovation and serves as team leader in the organizational development matrix at the European Commission. Andrea, thank you for being here today and welcome. I don't know if Andrea uh, is having issues with the connection. No, indeed, I had an uh, issue with the not switching on my mic. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there you are. <laughs> yes, thanks. So I want to thank uh, the challenge owners and the solution providers for their commitment to solving these difficult challenges. I will work more closely with the challenge uh, that the Spanish government team uh, introduced. I accompanied the work of the observatory since its establishment, and I saw it evolve from a research project into a brand or like a go-to place for knowledge on innovation in government over the years. And now it has reached another major step in ambition and also in maturity, as it supports these multi-country collaborations, cracking tough challenges in government in the incubator program. Now, this is an important momentum, I feel. 
uh, to celebrate years of investment, the growing community of governments committing to innovation, the growing appetite to collaborate across borders, and the hard work of dedicated professionals behind the whole program, uh, especially the OPSI team. So thank you, team. I uh, personally work in the organizational development side of the business at the European Commission in the Research and Innovation Service. I find that uh, in general, public service is great in coming up with ideas, sorry, <clears throat> conceptualizing, defining solutions and building strategies. But we are a lot less successful when it comes to embedding the new solutions into the existing system and sc scaling the new solutions and learning from the innovation process. Often we implement a project quickly and small scale and hope we turn to the next project on the to-do list. In my view, it is not the innovation project teams alone that should take the trouble to scale the new solution, manage the idea upwards in the hierarchy and to fight the uphill battles or to document the learning uh, from the experience, but alongside the organizational development teams that then can cater for the benefit of the whole organization. Today, uh, unfortunately, way too many valuable public sector projects remain fairly small and stay local, never become visible for the whole organization. And this also means that only incremental changes survive over time. Um, but we have seen and heard uh, many inspirational cases, uh, some of which was introduced uh, here already in the session. Uh, we can see that the dominant logic that uh, built the command and control regimes for managing public spending is actually changing, even if it's not as fast as we wish uh, it was, but changing. The work of government teams we heard in this session and the OPSI team are the living proof of that. I feel, I mean, if it feels for me, it feels great to contribute and be part of this process. I'm very much looking forward to engaging with the project teams and learning from the solution providers how they did it and how they made the radical solution stick beyond the incremental. Uh, so looking forward to this adventure together in the next six months. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. And now I go back to Joao to tell us more about the, the program. Thank you, Bea. And thank you, all the speakers from the advisory board. So now we want to talk to you a little bit about the cohort-based learning track, um, which is given the high demands demonstrated for the, the main track of the incubator and the incredible ap applications we received, we decided to create a parallel track um, which is a cohort-based learning track, which will offer an opportunity to 30 government teams from all around the world to collaborate on specific innovation challenges. So this track is anchored on five thematic sessions, working on themes such as open experimentation, cultural transformation, citizen involvement, evidence-based policy making, or scaling public services. And the idea is that in each session, three selected innovation challenges will be presented and through a structured collaborative method, uh, teams will learn from each other novel ways of working, exchange resources, um, and share opportunities with each other. Uh, and to talk to us about the value of this track, we have some participants, uh, namely uh, Eva Brozova, um, who is the Deputy Director for Strategic Development and Chief Strategy Officer at the Technology Agency of the Czech Republic. Um, and Eva, um, we're excited to hear what value do you see in this cohort-based learning track? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me. Uh, first of all, on behalf of myself and uh, of the entire team uh, of our agency, uh, let me express our gratitude to be part of this cohort-based uh, learning track running in parallel to the OECD uh, Gov2Gov incubator. Uh, we appreciate very much that you opened this possibility also for other uh, high-quality uh, applicants beyond the initial four for the incubator. And I personally believe this uh, really makes this inclusive approach uh, will bring additional 
impact and amplify the impact of the whole OECD uh, initiative. Uh, so we are bringing a challenge, which is from the area of support of research development and uh, innovation. Uh, our challenge is called developing strategic approach towards funded projects to maximize their impact. Basically, just shortly to introduce the, the challenge, we are the major provider of support to applied research uh, in Czechia. We have already funded thousands of projects and now we need to enhance the system, how we work with the projects to bring more impact and Basically, we want to work with the researchers, with the excellent projects we have uh, and their uh, research results to uh, for better evidence-informed uh, policymaking to enhance our calls, but not only our calls, but also some strategies in the Czech Republic, like the smart specialization strategy. And for this, we need to explore uh, new methods of work with the researchers, like some foresight methods. So basically the key reason why we are here, why we wanted to join uh, the, the incubator uh, is that this is a unique opportunity that we will receive some valuable insights from the expert from the OECD and also from the, uh, the international peers who will be part of uh, the core-based learning and who might have faced similar uh, challenges. We want to learn best practices, but also uh, what really resonated with me was, was what Lara Salinas uh, from the board said about failure. We really want to hear perhaps some criticisms because we have some path that we chose for this challenge, but maybe it's not the best part. The best path, we might hear some criticism and this could help us to avoid some uh, blind alleys. So uh, this is a great motivation for us to take part of this. Uh, anyhow, we have our experience with similar knowledge exchange from Tafti Network, the network, the European um, Innovation Agencies Network, and uh, we have great experience from this. So we hope through the OCD we will again gain another angle uh, to our initiative. So this will push us forward similarly to uh, how Tafti knowledge exchanges uh, push us forward. Moreover, we are also keen to learn from the others, from the, the other uh, challenges and the sessions that uh, we'll be taking part in. And I must say that the topics that you chose for the five sessions are very much relevant for us as well. So we hope to learn a lot through this and bring fresh ideas from these initiatives uh, to our agency. So. Thank you very much uh, for this, and we look forward to collaborating and uh, participating in this second site. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva, for those uh, insights. Um, and now we, all, we also have with us Almendra Orbegoso. Uh, she's a researcher in the Service and Digital Innovation at the Laboratorio de la Secretaria de Gobierno y Transformación Digital de Peru. Um, and she will, she will also share with us um, what value does she see in this cohort-based learning track. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone from, from Lima, Peru. Well, uh, I work as a researcher at the Laboratorio de la Secretaría de Gobierno y Transformación Digital de Peru. Uh, I'm here representing Niños Digitales Peru, that is an initiative aimed at empowering girls by developing their digital skills through innovative methodologies in public schools, inspiring them to pursue careers in science and technology. And as a team, we are grateful for being part of the Gov2Gov Innovation Incubator Program. We think it is an inspiring opportunity as, and as part of this cohort-based learning track, we believe it can unlock a potential for our project by addressing one of our main challenges, that is scalability across Peru's diverse uh, public educational landscape. In early stages of the project, um, Niños Digitales Peru um, successfully reached over 7,000 girls uh, through online programming workshops that gave us key insights uh, about the process. Uh, since the approval of the National Policy of Digital Transformation in mid-2023, 
And given that Niña Digitales is one of the prioritized services in set policy, we have initiated a comprehensive redesign to enable the program's effectiveness and ensure a long-term focus on, on achieving its such objectives. Through um, user-centered design process, we uncovered key principles that shape uh, the development of program focused on equity for girls, ensuring relevance and safety, promoting a community-based and collaborative approach, and maintaining an iterative and simple model by leveraging the resources available in each public school. We believe that gov to gov incubator program offers cross-border expertise that could help us overcome these challenges, whether through innovative approaches or by learning from similar experiences in other governments. Um, at, its, at its core, Niños Digitales Peru is driven by the urgent need to close this gender gap in technology by empowering girls with essential digital skills, and more importantly, the confidence to explore and thrive in this traditionally male-dominated field. Our vision is to create a future where girls and boys, women and men from all socioeconomic backgrounds have equal opportunities to thrive in the digital world. And for us, success means significantly increasing the numbers of educational communities involved in the program and its goals, particularly in vulnerable areas where access has been historically limited. This is about um, facilitating digital transformation and innovation in places where it has been scarce. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Almendra, for your contribution. Um, and next, we had a Q&A, but I believe uh, we're running out of time. Uh, so I'll pass it to Bruno now uh, so that he can close the session. Well, first of all, thank you so much to all of you that uh, joined us today, that stayed with us uh, for 90 minutes, uh, in particular to the ones that started collaborating uh, with us some months ago as challenge owners and as solution providers, and now also as participants in this course based on learning uh, track. As you can see, it's a very big family portrait that we presented today. This is also to, sh to show how important uh, it is for us to have this moment where we can gather all of our insights, all our, all of all of our doubts, our failures to repeat the words, so we can really make the best out of uh, this collective intelligence exercise that we plan to do in the coming six months, both in the incubation process and in the course-based learning track. And to start with my concluding remarks, and I won't say that we don't want to fall short of our promise of having a Q&A moment. So some of you already shared very good questions using the chat. You still have time to do that. If not, you can use our email address, reach out to us, share your insights, share your questions. We will make uh, the best uh, to answer them, to reply, to share some uh, information that may answer to your needs. This is really, really important uh, for us. So and we don't want to fall short of what we promised at the beginning. The second thing I want to, to say is that this is not the closure of the project. I mentioned that at the beginning. We are opening a new phase. This is a very important phase because as we mentioned, this is an, a, a process that is being done by, for the first time. We are testing ourselves, the model that we have been designing, the methodology that we have been designing. We have been engaging critically with all participants trying to use uh, uh, their insights, their feedback as an opportunity to improve while we are moving um, uh, ahead. So we really appreciate that you take uh, what I think Lara Salinas has mentioned. This is an opportunity to find a safe space, a safe space where we can, of course, uh, learn with each other, exchange our ambitions, but also where we can try out things that do not have their success warranty from the onset. And I like that expression of using the innovation incubator as your critical friend. That's precisely the point of the innovation incubator. The innovation incubator is being done to deliver value, to create impact in the projects we are running. That do not mean that we are finding here a magical solution to solve all our problems. At the same time, we believe this is an important 
uh, as a demonstrative example, how important it is to connect across borders, but also how possible it is to make it happen. So uh, thanking uh, very particular to uh, the European Commission program Horizon Europe, because it was this program that enabled the OECD Observatory of Public Sector Innovation to set this program, to invite uh, uh, the community to share their challenges with us, to come up with their potential uh, solutions uh, to support other, other countries. Um, we we appreciate also the the the, the opportunity to um, enlarge the invitation uh, to all of you to share with us any comments any ideas that you may have. As I say, being this an experimental initiative, we we depend on the feedback we are receiving, the ideas that you may have regarding the future of the program, the continuation of the program. It's a great moment for us uh, to expose us to the to the to critics, to suggestions, to ideas for the time uh, to come. Trying to keep it uh, short, uh, thanking again to all the challenge owners for stepping uh, in. Uh, we know it is not easy to come forth and uh, let others know that we need support, we need help. It, we are available to exchange ideas. So we really appreciate your, wor your work as pioneers in this, in this project. We also want to thank to all the solution providers that are in a very, I would say, engaged way coming forward with all the knowledge and learning they had accumulated. Some of them have things that went very well, others probably not so well, as an opportunity to enrich other colleagues' um, initiatives and projects. And uh, finally, to um, let all people that, is, that are participating in the, in the court based learning track, we are talking about 30 different teams. So in addition to the 12 teams that are participating in the cohesion process, we have 30 additional teams participation in the cohort based learning track, that we really count on you to touch on these very cutting edge issues. Some of them, as uh, Heather has mentioned uh, right at the beginning, do not have yet a clear answer, do not have yet a preset uh, roll of thumb that we can use to solve it. So we really appreciate that you come forward and that you make the partnership to be not just the end of the of the of the conversation, but the, the starting point for new unexpected, I hope, ways of delivering value to our public administrations and, of course, providing better lives for our uh, uh, citizens and for our uh, societies. Thank you to all of you that stayed with us. Uh, we really appreciate the time that you spent. Uh, please feel free to reach us directly using the email address we already uh, shared. We will, again, appreciate any questions, any ideas that you may have. If you just want to keep following up the program, let us know. We will do our best to keep you uh...